Hello everyone and welcome back to Identity Architects. I'm your host Ben Cicchetti and for this episode our sales director Jess Bradley had the opportunity to sit down with Rowena Humby, CEO at StarCount, to discuss identity, the cookie-less future, how data can be used to improve the customer experience, data collaboration and much much more. Before we jump into that conversation I want to tell you about a live discussion we've got coming up. On March 30th, we'll be hosting a webinar, Collaboration in the Data Clean Room, and we'll be joined by industry leaders from Boots, ITV, Kantar, and Wavemaker to discuss how data clean rooms are enabling organizations across the entire advertising ecosystem to unlock the full potential of their data. To find out more and to register, head over to infosum.com and to our events page. One more plug, and that's to remind you to hit that subscribe button wherever you enjoy podcasts to know when the next episode of Identity Architects lands. But now, without any further delay, I'm thrilled to hand over to Jess and Rowena. Rowena, thank you so much for joining us today on our Identity Architects podcast. It's a real pleasure to have you. And for anyone that doesn't know you already, can you just give us a quick intro into Rowena Humby, yourself and your business star count, who you are and what you do? Of course, and thank you very much for inviting me. I'm excited to be here. So um, I'm Rowena Humby. I'm the CEO of StarCount. Um, For those that don't know StarCount, we are an insights agency who specialise in consumer behavior science, i.e. using large behavioral data sets to understand why customers do what they do. Um, So we work with our clients' first party data, uh, but we also enrich with the market's best enrichment data sets. Um, And we have our own proprietary data set, which shows what people love and care about, uh, built from what they follow on social and combined with demographic data to create kind of nationally representative panels at huge scale. Um, And we focus on what people love because what we care about is really the key to what drives us and motivates us to buy, Um, you know, our love for the environment, our health, our family, our home, our technology. These are the things that drive our brand decisions um, as kind of emotive human beings. Amazing. And would would it be right to say that you're you're bringing emotion and, and, and mindset into advertising? That's exactly right. So what we champion is mindset marketing, which is connecting emotionally with customers by understanding what they care about most. So whether you are an automotive brand, an insurance brand, a charity, a retailer, people don't buy your products because of your product. They buy it because it represents something they care about in their life. And that's really what we're here to help brands understand. Amazing. Thanks, Rina. And out of interest, what's your... What's your earliest memory of advertising and marketing? (laughs) Um, So my earliest memory is I remember when I was younger and my parents both worked and on a Saturday and Sunday, they would say to me and my brother, you do not wake us up before 9am, go downstairs and turn on turn on the TV and we'll be up at nine. So we used to watch Saturday morning cartoons on linear TV. And the advert I remember the most, um, God knows why, it was the Playmobil advert with the ship in water. And I just loved it because it was this toy that was like floating about in a in a pool full of water. Um, and yeah, anyway, my love for the, for the sea and boats continues today. <laughs> I do know. I, I remember that advert actually, and it's yeah. amazing to think that there was once a day where there were only I think four channels until Channel Five came along, and that was the most exciting thing as a child that there was an extra channel. Um, exactly. I don't think children would know what to do now with only four channels and and no iPads. And and what was your first job in in advertising marketing? Um, so I, my first job was a, a data scientist um, performing audience segmentations for our clients. Um, I had kind of learned data skills from, I studied um, physics and astronomy at university. So I learned, you know, a lot of data skills there because my kind of final year was all about collecting data through telescopes and understanding galaxies and stars. Um, but academia wasn't really for me. I've always loved people. Um, I'm passionate about understanding why people do what they do through the experiences they've been through. Um, so I was very lucky that um, 
I got a job kind of straight into this industry that I've never left. Um, I, you know, it just so happens that my parents, um, Clive Humvee and Edwina Dunn, pioneered customer data science with their business Dunn Humvee working on Tesco Club Card. Um, so they'd sold that business to Tesco um, just before I left university. And when I came out, before I went off backpacking, they offered me to come and kind of earn some money and work with them. And I just fell in love with what they did and how we can understand what drives humans from data. I just think it's it's fascinating and so exciting. So that, that's so interesting. And I, I had no idea that you you studied physics and astronomy. It's, it's interesting because I think you've, you've got a really unique, um, I guess, skill set and perspective, having this, this science data brain, but also having this really personable approach to what you do and bringing sort of bringing that that data which is it's is is quite a sort of scientific approach to thing but also bringing in the emotion which I guess is exactly what star count does absolutely and it's you know I think um it's interesting because data is so often seen as very technical like you said very scientific but the art of data the creativity of doing things like really good customer segmentation, understanding what motivates us, as you said, the emotional side is actually more a creative piece. And so we try and combine that at StarCount, bringing the scientific capability of big behavioral data sets with the human element and the ability to be creative and understanding why the data shows that and what that means that um, customers care about. Yeah, I think I think that's an amazing approach. And, and, and I think that that really is is where our industry is going and where it needs to go this this ability to kind of take the silos away from um data solutions scientific capability sitting sort of over here and then and having the the emotional side and the creativity sitting here actually that ability that you've achieved the star count to actually bring that together creates some pretty amazing opportunities for 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 businesses and Knowing what you know now, would you say, um, is there anything you'd say to yourself um, when you when you started your career? Oh, yes, I think, I, you know, actually building on that exact point, um, I think if I had the opportunity to go back and, and tell my younger self, I'd say, don't try and pigeon yourself into one role, because when you discover your strengths, and what you add to a team, that's when you'll find your progression path. So for example, um, when I started as a data scientist, I, I loved it and I could apply my technical skills to it, but also that kind of more human element. But then we started growing the team and hiring these incredible data scientists, you know, PhDs, AI experts, machine learning experts, and I felt, felt totally inadequate. Um, and what when I had my breakthrough was when I realized that what I brought to the team was that I could communicate what these incredibly technical people were doing to our clients and explain the methodology in a simple way, and also have the ability on the reverse to hear our clients challenge, decipher their pain point and communicate that back to the team, which is, and therefore that's what I think the data solutions should be. So it was that conduit between the technical and the human um, that was when I found, you know, what I feel like was now my true calling and, and the career that I wanted to, to be in. I think that's that is just so powerful because I think it's something we see all the time where, you know, in businesses as well, we tend to have this divide between, you know, technical and, and commercial, for example, because I think commercial tends to be the sort of more the, the emotion, the human side of a business. But actually what you've got is this real unique ability that you have the hands on experience from a from a data, technical, scientific perspective. But this ability to translate that in a way that that brands can actually digest at any level to help them understand value. And that's obviously what makes you incredibly unique. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> and, and is this is this part of what you, you, you love about what you do and and the industry you're in? Absolutely. I mean, look, I love people. I love understanding what drives us, um, how our behaviours are driven by what's important to us. Um, and I know it's cheesy, but I couldn't imagine a job that better allows me to breathe that day in, day out. And ultimately, our clients are 
marketers and their job is communicating with customers. Um, you know, they are communication experts. Um, and so working with them to um, increase that performance and, and, and connect more emotionally with their customers and understand their customers um, is, is really the dream for me. Um, and I also think that there aren't many new data sets out there. Um, you know, when people ask who our competitors are, there are they tend to be the data providers that have been in the market for decades and still doing the same thing in the same way. So we love that we've innovated a new capability for the market. Um, because I think a lot of the innovation that's been going on is in technology, which is so important because technology is the enabler, but technology without data is, you know, like a supercar engine without fuel in it. <laughs> Absolutely, I think that's I think that's an incredibly good uh, analogy, um, and I think you know InfoSum very much sits in that space. As you know, we're 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 a technology um, provider. We're that vehicle that enables for these uh, these rich data collaborations. But but without partners like Starcount, um, we, we we can't do what we do. I think you've 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 touched on some some really interesting things because we're we're starting to see you know conversations that we're having with brands, conversations we're having with agencies, and with all the changes in privacy regulations, there is so much more focus on the consumer now, and it's it's forced, it's sort of brands have been forced to put their consumers' privacy at the forefront. But actually, from from what you're saying, it sounds like you've always. Um, focused on what's important to the consumer which I think would you say that as an industry we've sometimes lost sight of that we focus so much on being data driven and, and technology that we actually lose sight on what we're trying to achieve that actually there's a consumer at the end of this and we're looking to understand their mindset understand what they want understand what they need in order to engage with them and and and, and engage with them in a meaningful way Absolutely. I think um, I think we've become obsessed with, um, I, you know, IDs and understanding consumers from the point of view of um, kind of who they are as an, an, an individual identifier. And actually what a consumer is, is, you know, their identity is actually what they care about, what they're interested in, what drives them. Um, and if we thought more about identity from that point of view i think that's and i think that's where the industry is going i think you know gdpr happened um not that long ago it was a really hard time for for the for the data industry we suffered as a business back then because it was unclear what was allowed and what wasn't allowed um, and it's taken some time to adjust but now businesses have really taken a lot of time to harness their first party customer data understand recency, frequency, value, behaviours, and how they can convert customers up that funnel. Um, and I think that similarly in the in the digital world, as we undergo the changes with cookies, um, we're going to see similar changes because we can no longer track an individual around the internet as we've been able to do before, but we can still understand their behaviours and we can still learn from each other and use those behaviours to enrich our understanding of who that um, that person is in terms of the things that they care about, the things that they read about, the things that they buy. Um, and that's why I think we're so excited about the InfoSum technology, because you guys facilitate bridging that knowledge, not IDs, but knowledge um, throughout the ecosystem. Absolutely. And I think I think you're everything you've said is just is just spot on and is, is very much it's very much aligned with what we're trying to preach in market because we are absolutely obsessed with this concept of identity. But actually, you know, do we take a step back and think about what, what is identity? You know, what, what does it actually mean? And it, it's absolutely like, you, you know, what you said, you know, these are people, these are individuals. Um, so how would you in very simple terms explain the term identity to a 10 year old? <laughs> what a great question. <laughs> um I, yeah, I think, you know, imagining, you know, speaking to a young person, I would say your identity is the things that you're passionate about, the things that you care about, whether that is the causes you care about, your your football team, the environment, your health, your fitness, your, your you know, your love of music or sports, whatever it might be, your identity is the thing that you're passionate about and that gets you out of bed each day. Um, so yeah, it's a it's a clever question because I guess it's the same as how 
you know, I think the industry is going, which is your identity is not your email address. It's not your cookie ID. It is what your what you care about, your mindset. And therefore, um, I think, yeah, our industry could learn a lot from <laughs> thinking about I was, it. I was, I, was, I was just about to say, absolutely, because we, we talk a lot about identity now from a from a personal perspective. It's it's a it's a it's a huge area that we're um, you know, we're we're embracing, aren't we, about this concept of identity from a from a very personal standpoint and everything you've said you know we we identify ourselves based on who we are what we care about what what's important to us and absolutely our industry could learn a lot about that rather than thinking about identity in a really one-dimensional it's a cookie or it's an email address it's just so much more than that um and what would you say keeps you awake at night (laughs) um well look what, what what keeps me awake at night is usually people problems. Um, you know, people are complex, <laughs> um, and I I a very empathetic person, and I worry about the impact sometimes. You know, things have on on the people around me. So I think you know an honest answer to that question is people people problems. Um, I think in terms of you know from a business perspective. Um, you know, it is the changing legislation. It's how fast um, we are allowed to do things now um, and how quickly legislation is catching up with the involvement of data and technology. Um, and, um, you know, as I said before, GDPR is was one of the, the best things for our industry because it put customer privacy first. But it was, at the time, incredibly debilitating. Um, however, it has been for me, the best thing for the data industry, because it's eliminated the cowboys who were commoditizing data. It's put the customers first. And I think clients are now learning and seeing the opportunity. Um, and I think the same is going to happen um, in the digital world as we go through the cookie changes. Absolutely. And I think you've, you've raised a good point because there's been a lot of doom and gloom around the cookie going and, and GDPR. And, and quite rightly so. It's a uh, Whenever there's a big change in the industry, it 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 causes fear and concern uh, for for every business involved through the supply chain. But actually, what we're starting to hear is there's actually a really really exciting opportunity. And I think as we get closer um, to a cookieless era, era, are you prepared for a post third party cookie world? And and what? What three things would you recommend that every brand and advertiser does in 2022? Because I think there's a huge amount of noise in market. Would you agree? A lot of advice. You should do this. You shouldn't do this. So so what would your advice be? Absolutely. There, there is so much, um, uh, so many people talking about where we should be going, what we should be doing. Um, we at StarCount are really excited about it. We are absolutely ready. Um, our philosophy is understanding audiences based on what they love and care about. And I think if you look at the three solutions that are being championed the most um, for the demise of the cookie, it's clean room technology such as InfoSum to facilitate data sharing and collaboration in knowledge. It's contextual audiences, no longer targeting people based on just ID behavior, but the fact that they display the contextual behaviors that are important for that brand and that brand's proposition. Um, And I think the final one for me is the opportunity to focus more on creative in a digital environment. I think the work that goes into creative for some above the line marketing, you know, in TV ads and things like that, um, digital has kind of become a lot more, it can be used as quite a transactional channel. channel. Um, And I think that it's an opportunity to start to say, as a brand, our customers shop with us for different reasons. And if we tailor the creative to the right contextual audience through the knowledge shared in clean rooms, that's gonna be the the full house solution um, in creating relevant marketing to the audiences that actually care and igniting them to engage with you as a brand. I think that's a really interesting point. And actually it it, kind of goes back to the, what you've been speaking about through this 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 idea of you know data and and, and science and, and technology very much needing to be sort of embedded with 
how we understand people rather than the two being siloed. And I think what you've raised about um, digital sometimes being guilty of being quite transactional and, and we're, we're, you know, we're obsessed with how we use data, but actually how can that inform creative, for example, because actually it's all good and well getting an, a holistic and, and, and good understanding of what, what drives people, what their mindsets are, what their emotions are, but we all react differently to, to different stimulus, right? So some of us respond to certain creatives, some of us respond to other creatives. And if we can get that that spot on we have an opportunity to to not just have meaningful engagement with with consumers but also to really enhance that engagement and actually really nurture them and give them something that they want rather than continuing with sort of throwing ads at people and 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 continuing this sort of ad fatigue that I think a lot of consumers have suffered from definitely I think less is more um and you know, being more relevant. A lot of the work we do with our clients on their retention marketing, on their CRM marketing is, you know, don't bombard them with three emails a week, send them one every two weeks, but make it really relevant. And focusing your efforts on personalizing the communications and spending the time to build those segments and tailor the creative is more effective than you know, thrashing out three different creatives that go out broad brush to everybody, you're going to see a better response and you're going to turn off less customers and less are going to unsubscribe. So it's definitely something that, you know, I think spans the whole of performance marketing as well, not just in, in that channel. So would you say it's, it would be right to say it's it's not so much a numbers game and when it really is about quality over quantity? Yes, I think so. I think... Um, you know, we, we only want to see, ultimately, people don't read ads, they read what interests them. If you can get your ad in front of someone, because it's timely, you know, I'm looking for a new insurance provider, I'm buying a new car, I'm going to engage with it. Um, that's obviously the, the great thing that digital has facilitated with search data, knowing that someone is in market, knowing that, that they have that intent. But Ultimately, at the same time, if you know, I may not see an ad when it's not timely to me, but if it's there in my presence, you know, for example, people who read articles about climate change are more likely to be someone who buys an electric vehicle. So joining up that context, knowing that I care about the environment and therefore I am more likely to buy an electric vehicle, that is just as powerful a connection as knowing that I was searching for a car on, on someone else's website yesterday. Absolutely. I mean, and there's and I think we sometimes forget, you know, there's so much psychology in this, isn't there? And like you said, you know, we, we could we could see one ad one day and we we just don't see it. But the next day we we really see it because it's it's come at the right time because I've just bought a car and I am searching for car insurance. Whereas if I'd been targeted with that ad the day before, it would be completely irrelevant. So I'm, I'm just not at, my brain's not going to make me aware of it. So I, I, I'm, I'm really passionate about this, this idea of, of, you know, how can we use data in, in the smartest way possible and, and, and almost create this, this holistic understanding of a, of a, of a consumer um, in order to, to make sure we really are um, providing something that is relevant to them at the right time. Because otherwise we, we, we end up in a situation where we can actually damage our, our 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 perception of our brand to them, would you say that's that's a fair thing to say? Yes, absolutely. I think that's bang on. <laughs> so, Google just recently announced the removal of Block and introduced its new tools topic. How did you perceive the announcement, and does that change anything for you? So, really behind the announcement. Um, Obviously, Flock is very much about, you know, sharing knowledge on people's behaviors. So a cookie gaining knowledge on what someone has been doing and how they've been behaving on all the websites before they come onto mine. Um, and ultimately, it can feel intrusive to people. You know, um, when you go onto someone's web website and you see an item you were just looking at on another website, you feel invaded. You feel like you're being tracked and you're being watched. Um, 
So I think the great thing about topics is it's looking more about the context of what I'm looking for um, and knowing that that is something that is currently important to me. So just builds really nicely on that, that point of it feels less like I'm being tracked and more like I'm being understood, which is when, when I think the use of data is being done right. I think that's such a good way of explaining it, absolutely, because because no one wants to feel like they're being watched, that there's sort of big brothers following them around the Internet. And it becomes very apparent that's the case when we get targeted with irrelevant advertising because we happen to have been on a on a website with certain content. It's actually understanding the context around that. Um, so I think that's I think that's incredibly interesting and, and very well said. And, you know, we've talked about this quite a bit with you know marketing is all about the consumers and their needs and that includes data privacy and shifting away from third party cookies what are the some of the challenges your clients face and how does star count support them today so we always champion that a client's first party data is their best asset ultimately that is your customers um but it's not always going to give you everything you need to understand them. Um, we typically see that 80% of our clients revenue comes from 20% of customers. Nearly every brand we've ever seen the data of, we can see that there is a very small proportion of customers that make up most of the spend. And that also means most of the knowledge, most of the data points that you have in your first party systems. So I think what we try and help our clients with is understanding who those high value customers are and how they can find more like them. And then for the customers that aren't high frequency, high value, but are still customers of that brand, it's understanding why they engage with them as a brand, what they love, what they care about and how we can convert them up the funnel. So I think the biggest challenge we see is um, spending that time on the first party data and feeling frustration with the fact that there's more to be done. Um, and so where we aim to help is saying, understand your customers, use your first party data, and then use data like star counts to understand how many more people there are out there that look like that. Um, what is it that they care about beyond you and your as a brand, and therefore an understanding of why they buy so that we can then use you know, an ecosystem like the InfoSum ecosystem to go and find more customers like that um, and speak to them at the touch points that are relevant to them as a consumer. Yeah, I think I think that's that's a really interesting um, point. You know, that there's and just just going back to what we spoke about earlier about there being a lot of noise in market about what companies should do. There, there's only a certain view that you can get from your own first party data um, based on how those individuals interact with your business alone. That data is valuable uh, because there's no better way to model out a, um, a new audience than looking at the people that are already high value customers or already have shown interest in your in, in your solution. Um, what would you recommend companies actually do to start off with? So. If, if a company is in the place where they know they need to do something when it comes to first party data, what would your advice be to them as a, as a starting point? So I think the, the starting point is always to understand your customers through the behavior that you can see um, with them through your own data. I then think enrichment data sets help fill in that gap. So looking to third party data sets, not third party party IDs, but third party enrichment, whether that's panel, mobile, retail, banking, social, whatever it might be, but understanding more about your customer groups and how they live their lives beyond shopping with you as a brand. So you can start to understand essentially segment your audience, understanding the different reasons that your customers connect with you as a brand and the propositions you offer them. Um, once you have an understanding of why they buy, you're in a really powerful place because all of a sudden you can speak to them in that right way. You can develop new propositions that build on that um, and you can remain you know, at the forefront 
and front of mind for customers um, as a brand choice that reflects the things that they care about that matter to them. And with, with the removal of trust and privacy barriers associated with traditional data sharing, we're seeing more brands collaborate with each other. How would you like to see brands and media owners engaging with each other in the future? Very good question. Kind of a political one as well, isn't it? It's a it's a complex shift because no one wants to pass on knowledge for the ad spend to go elsewhere. But ultimately, if we all remember what we're trying to do, whether a brand or a media owner, is we are trying to reach new or existing customers. We are trying to engage the people that care about our brands. And I think we will all succeed by creating a better experience for the customer by collaborating. Um, and those that resist that change are ultimately going to lose out because they may not share their knowledge with other parties, but all that means is they're not gaining the benefits of sharing across the board. The best parallel I can think of is, you know, look what happened when Tesco gave their customer data to the CPGs. It transformed everything. Um, Tesco could have kept that data completely private. They could have continued to understand their customers for their benefit and, you know, not um, helped the brands understand who their customers were. But by, by working with the CPGs and showing them who their customer was and what else they were buying in the store, these brands could develop you know, better marketing, better placement, better range. And I think that knowledge over time trumps short-term spend and revenue wins. Yeah, absolutely. And so would you say that now that we can remove with, with, with solutions like InfoSum, now that we can remove the need to actually share data, lose control of data, and I mean, ultimately, you know, historically, companies don't trust each other. That's just that's just an unfortunate reality. But if we take those issues away, then actually there's there's a huge opportunity. If 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 brands actually embrace this change, there's a huge mutually beneficial opportunity for collaboration that can result in not just enhanced consumer peer, ex, consumer experience, but also in significant growth for those brands that are prepared to embrace this way of working. Yes, absolutely. I think, um, you know, where we are so excited about, you know, what the, the solution that InfoSum facilitates is exactly that. It's allowing a brand to, you guys facilitate the sharing of knowledge, not the sharing of, you know, physical data. And what's so smart about that is, we all learn about who our customers are and who our potential customers are um, by using that collaborative environment. So I think it's ultimately a way of us understanding where else our customers are shopping, where they're spending their time in publisher environments, what TV shows they're watching, you know, um, where they're going to events and buying tickets. As we start to have an ecosystem where we can see that the customers that behave with us in a certain way are spending time and money elsewhere. We learn more about them. We learn more about what matters to them. And so we can create a better experience for them as a brand, as well as, you know, sharing that knowledge so that other people can create better experiences and knowledge for that brand. Um, so, yes. <laughs> so hopefully we can get to a point where actually consumers um feel rather than feeling frustrated by being targeted by so many ads they actually feel valued and nurtured by brands and welcome these ads because actually they're they're relevant um and they are actually provide giving them something rather than feeling like they're just being constantly bombarded with 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 lots of different ads and i think we you know we're starting to see more and more really interesting collaborations that weren't possible or even thought relevant before. Are there any collaborations that you would like to see more um, of? Are there any industries um, you'd like to see this happening in? Yeah, good question. I think, you know, I think what I'm most excited about is um, the fact that 
this kind of technology can facilitate collaborations between the advertisers and the media agencies. Brands and advertisers, you know, they quite often work with their own channels, their retention channels, whether that be their CRM, their email database, sometimes they do some in-house digital, and then they outsource the above the line advertising um, to media agencies. Um, and not just above the line, you know, I think TV, digital, radio, out of home, mail. Ultimately, the I think the most exciting collaboration that this kind of solution brings is the fact that the media agencies can actually learn from the customer data because it provides them access to understanding the customer and where those touch points are across, you know, across the ecosystem. Um, so using the brand as a seed, understanding and gaining knowledge about that audience and using that to define both their creative and media strategy across those, across those major channels. So what you're saying really is actually that there's not just an opportunity here for advertisers to um, enhance their relationships with their consumers, but actually this 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 the ability to create these data collaborations without this fear of losing control of data and the need to share data is actually going to enhance their relationships with media agencies. This, this ability to be much more transparent to for, for agencies to actually have visibility and regardless of it being at an aggregated level of their advertisers, their clients' data to be able to help them to better execute briefs and better execute campaigns. Exactly. You know, these global media agencies, they have the best planners in the world working with them um, and they you know, have the opportunity to do some very exciting and amazing things on behalf of their clients. Um, but it's very rare that customer data is shared between a brand and a media agency. And I think this kind of solution facilitates the agencies gaining knowledge, as you say, on aggregate audiences within the customer base that's going to allow them to plan more intelligently, target more intelligently and create um, more robust and exciting creative that's going to, you know, trigger that emotional response that ultimately we want to drive in in customers to get them to engage with us as a brand. Yes, I mean, actually, what they're going to be able to do finally is actually real people marketing, rather than, you know, agencies um, sort of being in a position where they're having to either look at pre-segmented audiences or create an audience group that might look like the type of people that might want to buy these products, they actually have that necessary insight from those brands without any of the issues that come with traditional data sharing to enable them to really optimize and, and, and do their jobs better. Because right now they're, they are slightly blind, really, aren't they, to, to what's going on between the consumers directly with the brands. Absolutely. And they, you know, they get shared knowledge on, on um, customers and, you know, what that campaign is about promoting in terms of both the proposition and the target audience. Um, but, you know, some of the best ideas come from collaboration from different areas. And I actually think, you know, before that brief even came in, could there be a united way of understanding the customer base, the audience and how that links to what that brand proposition ignites in a consumer and that kind of collaborative working, I think, could lead to some of the best work. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. And what do you want to or need to say in this that you haven't already mentioned? Is there anything else you'd like to add? Um, just that we are excited. Change is on the horizon. Um, we see you know, we are excited about working with InfoSum, about being in InfoSum, because you guys are innovating in an industry that is going through a significant change. And I love to reflect and kind of, <laughs> as the as the analyst in me would say, do the retrospective analysis and look at what's happened in the past and how that's how that's changed things. And you know, we were talking earlier about TV ads and, you know, when it used to be linear TV and <laughs> sat there on a Saturday morning watching watching the kids shows. But, you know, when TVs first came about in the 1950s, 
and ad spots were first released on them, they just played radio programs. They just did a voice with a, with a plain black screen because they didn't realize that they could do that visual advertisement. And that was something that had to be innovated. Similarly, the first ever big data set that came into the marketing industry was the census data, where we could segment people based on geodemographics. And that introduced things like mail as an advertising channel, being able to reach different demographic profiles. And of course, is still where, you know, still plays a huge part in things like out of home combined with mobile data. Um, and we've talked a lot about GDPR and its impact on email marketing um, and how that's created businesses taking better care and better use of their customer data and spending more time to understand the segments they've got and personalizing creative to the right customer groups. So it's an exciting time. I can't wait to see what happens with the media landscape. You know, digital is up there with TV as the biggest spending channel in, in, in the world today. Um, so I'm excited to see where we go um, and embrace the change. Um, so, yeah, I just I think that's that's my kind of comment on that. <laughs> so would your would your sort of final message to advertisers be be something on the lines of stop being scared, be excited, actually embrace the change. And if you do, you have the opportunity to not just survive and miss these changes, but actually really thrive in a way that you haven't been able to before. Absolutely. I couldn't have said it better myself. I, I, think it's a, <laughs> I think it's a huge opportunity. I think don't be afraid, be excited, embrace the change, adapt um, and try new things. Test and learn. Put 20% of your budget toward marketing budget towards test and learn. And don't give up on the first attempt because when something works, it will be incredibly exciting. And these big disruptions are when some of the most exciting innovations reveal themselves. And I think that's a really great final point because, you know, like we said, there's a lot of noise in market. There are a lot of solutions out there, um, InfoSum being one of them as a sort of vehicle for being able to create those data collaborations. But I think sometimes advertisers have this tendency of trying to find that holy grail that's going to do everything. And actually, it's so important to test and learn because there might be multiple different solutions that are going to enable them to really thrive. So thank you so much, Rowena. This has been incredibly interesting for me as well and I think you have just the most fantastic way of explaining things and you have such a unique perspective you know having come from um, being a data scientist yourself and having that technical understanding but also having this ability to you know really understand what drives people and have that really sort of human element you're really bringing sort of humility and data together which I think is incredibly unique and is obviously why Star Count is so successful so thank you so much for joining today. Thank you so much for having me and for those lovely lovely words um, I would never pass up an attempt to come and speak to you Jess so thank, thank you, thank you for having me and, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I've really enjoyed the conversation thank you. Me too, me too, thank you. Thanks again to Rowena for joining us. I really loved this conversation and I think it's because Jess and Rowena continually brought this conversation back to consumers who should really be at the heart of everything we do. And I love the phrase Rowena used, it feels less like I'm being tracked and more like I'm being understood. It's just such an important lesson for all of us as marketers creating data-driven experiences to remember. All that leaves for me to do is remind you to hit that subscribe button so you know when the next episode of Identity Architects lands. But until next time, thanks for listening.